Good morning, everyone. This is Mrs. Weichel. I hope each one of you had a wonderful holiday break. Um, it's time now to start a new unit. We're going to be starting a unit, especially for my blended students. My remote students, you have kind of already started this process. They're a wee bit behind you because of the decision to go remote in December. So, But you're going to be reviewing, which is important for you as well. This is a skill that we did not discuss in fourth grade due to the closure of in March. So 4.6 weather. And I'm going to move myself for a moment because I can't get my slide to move. Sorry, guys. All right. The first concept that we're going to be looking at are some skills and things that we look at for weather. And the first one is temperature. And we focus on temperature. We know a lot about that, especially this time of year, as well as with the COVID, we are taking measurements of everybody's temperature as well. But what is temperature when you're thinking about it? Temperature is the measure of the amount of thermal energy in the atmosphere. And if you go back to when we talked about it in November at the beginning, we talked about different types of energy. And one of the energies that we focused on was that of thermal energy. And if you think back, the word therm we talked about was a meaning in science. Therm means heat. So if we think about thermostat, I control my thermostat in my house. That means I'm controlling the heat or the amount of heat in my house. Um, thermometer control measures the amount of heat that's coming out of my body or coming out of my machine that I'm using, such as my heating system. Or even, we talked about this with energy, thermal underwear. And thermal underwear is used when we're discussing with uh, people who go hunting and they want to keep warm and it keeps their body heat inside them. So the word thermo thermometer is the amount of heat energy in the atmosphere and that we're measuring that amount of heat. So again, thermal means heat. So it's the measure amount of heat energy in the atmosphere. Now, as we go to slide two, what instrument do we use to measure thermal energy? And that is a thermometer. A thermometer is an instrument that measures and indicates the temperature, which means indicates the amount of thermal energy or the amount of heat energy. In science, we use the metric system. In the metric system, we would use Celsius. Remember, we talked about this at the beginning of the year. Everywhere else in the world uses Celsius, so scientists have to speak with the other parts of the world. Now, in the United States, we use the standard system. In the standard system, we would use Fahrenheit. But since we're in science world, we have to use that of Celsius. Now, the next concept we're going to look at is that of, the next concept we're going to be looking at is that of air pressure. Air pressure, if you think about the word, the word will kind of tell you what it does. It is due to the amount of weight of air that is placed on the atmosphere and is determined by several factors such as the temperature of the air. It's the pull of the gravity on the atmosphere of a particular place on earth. So think about it. it's the amount of air pressure that's being placed on the earth. Everybody put your hands together. Air pressure. It's the amount of pressure being placed on the earth. Air pressure, amount of air that's being placed on the earth. Press, air pressure. Yes. As we move on, think about the word. Now we're going to be looking at the next, what instrument is going to measure air. The instrument that is used to measure air pressure is a barometer. Barometer is an instrument that measures the atmospheric pressure, which means the air pressure. Used especially for forecasting the weather and determining the altitude. So in ways that I remember to help myself, you know, I like to come up with different ways to help myself as well as you remember what these words are. So if you think about the air pressure, it's the amount of pressure that we're placing on the earth. Every time I think of this, I always think of a muscle man and he's got that bar that he's going to push above his head. So he's a bar pressure. So he's going to put his bar, he's going to put as much air pressure on that to lift it up. 
So everybody think about a bar. Everybody put your hands like this. Bar meter or bar um, barometer is the correct terminology. But everybody put your hands. Put this, the measures the amount of air pressure on the earth. Barometer is the amount of measures the amount of air pressure on the earth. All right, push show me your muscles. All right, barometer is the amount of air pressure I put on the earth. Barometer, air pressure. We see your muscles working. Barometer, air pressure. 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 All right. So the next one we're going to be looking at is an instrument that measures the amount of wind speed. If you look at this picture here on the left side of your screen, it will show you what an anemometer looks like. They are cups. And as the wind grabs a hole inside the cup, it spins it around. So put your hands like this. An anemometer is measuring the amount of wind speed. Anemometer, say like anemometer, measures the amount of wind speed. Anemometer is measures the amount of wind speed. And if you look here, now this picture really it's hard to see, but as that twists around, that goes up and down, and there's a scale that measures how fast the wind speed is going. So everybody put your hand here. Anemometer. Anemometer measures wind speed. Anemometer measures wind speed. All right, so we've talked about temperature. And what measures that? A thermometer. That measures the amount of heat in the atmosphere. Then we have a air pressure. And what measures that? A barometer. A barometer measures air pressure. Air pressure. Air pressure. Animator measures wind speed. Animator measures wind speed. Now, rain gauge. Rain gauge, you can buy at Walmart if you want to this spring, and measures the amount of precipitation. Precipitation can be rain, snow, hail, freezing rain, sleet. It's the amount of liquid that comes and gets into the graduated cylinder. Yes, a rain gauge is another type of graduated cylinder. If you go back to September, we talked about a graduated cylinder. A graduated cylinder is a device that measures the amount of space something takes up, known as volume. So how much space is that liquid precipitation taking up in that graduated cylinder, known as a rain gauge? So a rain gauge is the amount of space that it's taking up. It's a device for collecting the amount of rain that we have received in a specific area. Hydrometer. Now think of the word hydro. It doesn't look like fire hydrant, but it kind of sounds like it in a way. So a hydrometer is an instrument that is used to measure the amount of water vapor or humidity in the air. And we mainly have a lot more humidity in the spring because, or in the summer, because of the amount of humidity that's coming out of our ocean water as they warm up. Water vapor is the gases that is even floating around your head right now. We are moving those water vapors around us. So do that. Hydrometer is the amount of humidity that we are collecting in the air. Humidity is also what makes us feel hot and sticky in the summer and sweaty not as even i'm not talking about when you go out and run a mile i'm talking about when you're just sitting there and you're like hot and miserable humidity is the amount of water vapor that's sitting on you because it's in the air so hydrometer is measuring the amount of water vapor or humidity in the air all right we've talked about four main concepts here or five main concepts excuse me five we've talked about thermometer which is measured with the temperature or temperature a barometer, which measures that of air pressure on the Earth's surface. A anemometer, which measures the wind speed. A rain gauge, which measures the amount of precipitation or liquid that has fallen from the sky. 
and that of a hydrometer, which measures the amount of humidity or water vapor. All right, let's think about this. Thermometer measures the amount of heat that's being, or thermal energy that's coming off of us, the Earth's surface or atmosphere. We have a barometer, and right, put your arms up, is the amount of air pressure. It measures the amount of air pressure, air pressure, air pressure. Then we have an anemeter, which measures the wind, measures the wind. Rain gauge measures the amount of precipitation that has fallen from the sky. And a hydrometer, H for hydro, and H for humidity, measures the amount of humidity in the air. The next couple slides are going to be that of YouTube videos that I'm going to share on Schoology as well that you may watch to assist you on the different types of instruments that are associated with these tools. All right, the next concept we're going to be looking at is the word front. Now, if you watch the news or the weather on the news, you probably have paid attention to these things. They may not directly talk about them to you, but they're focusing on these as they are working toward weather forecasting. Fronts is the boundaries between air masses of different temperature and humidity, meaning the water vapor, that was, can result in stormy weather. Now, there are two fronts that we're going to be working on, cold fronts and warm fronts. Then now, there are two others that they focus on, but in fourth grade and fifth grade concepts, you only have to know cold front and um, warm front. If you want to know any more, there's also occluded front and stationary front. Cold front, it gives its name. Now, think about what that word says. Cold front comes in and brings cold air in. Okay, comes and slams in because an air mass is where two come in, slam like a car hitting each other. Cold air comes in and slams against warm air. And as a result of cold air coming in, it pushes warm air up and bringing forth th thunderstorms or even heavy snow. Cold air is heavier, so therefore it sinks to the bottom and warm air is lighter and it pushes up. All right, so cold fronts. Everybody put your fists together. Cold front is where cold air comes in, slams into warm front, and pushes it out of the way, resulting in thunderstorms or heavy snow. Again, cold front, pushing warm front out of the way. Now, warm front, same idea, except now I'm pushing in warm air and pushing cold air out of the way. So come in, two air masses. Warm air comes in because it's warmer. It pushes cold air in out of the way on the bottom. See, it's over here. And that sits there, bringing forth light rain or light snow. Warm air replaces cold air. All right, again, warm air comes in, pushes cold air out of the way and sits. Okay, warm air comes in and pushes and sends cold air packing. Goodbye, my dear. Now, the next thing, if you want to look at a map, the map tells us what direction that the front is coming. If you look at this map here, this is a cold front symbol. The arrows point to the direction in which the air mass is moving. This cold air is moving from the west south toward Texas. And if you look at that, the arrows are showing the direction that the cold air is pushing. And if you see, it's pushing the warm air up and out of the way. Now, all right, the next section we're going to be looking at is high pressure and low pressure. High pressure is a system in whirling mass of cool, dry air that generally brings fair weather and light winds. The view from above, the winds swirl at a high pressure system in a clockwise motion. So if you think about the clock and you look at this circle here on where my face is, then you can think about how it goes. It goes toward the right. So it's going to swirl this direction toward the right. So in the northern hemisphere, and that's where you're living, that's anything above the equator. 
So when the air, when we view it from the sky, it's going to look like that it's swirling in a clockwise motion. These bring sunny skies to us. And on a map, it is represented with a blue H. All right, let's go over that again. High pressure system is a whirling of air, cool, dry air, which means there's very limited humidity that brings fair weather and sunny skies and little rain. Low pressure system is a whirling mass of warm, moist, most likely higher humidity, air generally bringing stormy weather and strong winds. When viewing from the above, the earth, like through a satellite, winds swirl at a low pressure and a counterclockwise. You know, looking at the circle, that means it's going to go toward the left. Counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, where you're living, anything above the equator. As it's represented on a map in a big letter, red, L. All right, again, the low pressure system is a warm air mass that's whirling that brings stormy strong winds. I'm going to use this map and I want you to look here is a high pressure system and a low pressure system. This is a system that brings forth more cool dry air. The low pressure system here is going to be bringing forth warm stormy moist air this is more fair weather fair weather sunny skies this is going to be more of our stormy weather because of the high moisture level so again high pressure system low pressure system now we're going to focus on the clouds there are different clouds and if you ever have the time and this is not the best of times to see different types of wet, uh, clouds sometimes it's very gray and gloomy at this time of the year but I'm sure that if you were a kid, you might have gone out in your yard and looked up at the sky. The first one we're going to look at is the cumulus. Excuse me, cumulus. I just gave you another name. A cumulus cloud. It's the poofy white clouds. I always think they look like big, giant globs of cotton balls or cotton candy. They are white, fluffy, and have a flat bottom normally generally indicating fair weather. There's the ones if you go out in, the, in your yard and you look up at the sky and you look and you see, oh, I see a dinosaur. No, I see um, an airplane. I see Snoopy. Snoopy. I see a bird. There are these different ones where we can indicate the kind of different shapes and have our imagination going wild with the cloud shape. So the cumulus, and if you look at the word, up there, if you look at this word, I always think it looks like a poofy word. See, it has a C and a U, and it just, I could draw a little squiggly lines. A lot of times, those are the kind of clouds that I draw, or the cumulus, because they're poofy and fluffy looking. Now, the next cloud we're going to look at is the one that goes along with it. They join together in making what is known as a cumulonimbulus cloud. These are the ones that go from the white clouds and become larger and darker on the bottoms and normally associated with thunderstorms and tornadoes. <clears throat> and I call this the bus cloud because this cloud is big like a bus and it also brings in our storms. So human nimulus is our poofy storm clouds that are blackish in color or grayish in color, or even has sometimes a tint of yellow. A lot of times tornadoes have a tint of yellow coloring to them. All right, so cumulus clouds are clouds that are poofy and white. Our cumulonimulus clouds are tornadoes and thunderstorm. Before I left in fifth grade, the last time that was on the SOL test a lot. So that's one that you really need to focus on to know the difference between them. Now, a stratus cloud. I don't know how many of you were up this morning or have been paying attention to the clouds. This cloud is one that's been sitting on the mountains the last couple days. This is our stratus cloud. And if you look at the word stratus, the word stratus looks like straight. It is our blanket cloud. That's what the word means. It is a Greek word that means blanket. 
it blankets the earth. It's low to the ground. It's closest one. It's our fog cloud. It's the one that sits on our mountains in Page County a lot. So if you go out there and you look and you see clouds on the mountains and you can't see the mountains, most likely you are seeing stratus clouds. They are smooth gray and cover the whole sky and block out the sun, known as a fall cloud. There normally is that of light rain and drizzle associated with it. And that's what that says behind my head. So it produces light rain and drizzle, meaning a little bit of rain. So you probably have seen those clouds in the sky. All right, so we've talked about cumulus clouds, cumulonimbus clouds, and now stratus clouds. Cirrus clouds. These are the ones that I always think look like an artist has taken over. This is where I think it looks like a paintbrush has kind of taken the cloud and just whoosh, with a dry paintbrush. I don't know why, but that's how I always think it looks like. And it also looks like a lot of times they're stacked on top of each other. If you look at the picture here that's showing, it kind of looks like there's one here and then there's one here and there's one here. We call the cirrus cloud. It's the highest one in the, in the cloud system. It is a feathery cloud, um, fair red weather. It is also made of ice crystals because it's so high in the sky. Um, where the others a lot of times have some water, more water vapor because they're closer to us on Earth. So they're farther away from us on the Earth, from the Earth. So they're cirrus. They're high in the sky like a big pizza pie, and they are made of ice. Now, when you see a cirrus cloud, you know that in the future, there's going to be some rain or snow that will be falling soon. A lot of times they say within an hour, if you see that, a lot of times there's going to be a rain or snow associated with it. There are that timeline, but there will be rain or snow that is associated with this. So if you see these, a lot of times in this time, I will look up in the afternoon and I'll see those um, when the sun is starting to set. So these are feathery looking clouds, kind of ones that are wispy, we call. Um, cirrus means curly hair. Um, so if you think about it, it's like curly hair that's going out from its source. So it's a feathery cloud that means fair weather at that point you see them, but indicating that rain or snow will be coming to us. <clears throat> I have another video that I'll be sharing with you. <clears throat> and another one. Okay, we're going to be looking at, if we talked about thunderstorms and we talked about tornadoes, now we're going to be talking about some of the storms that are associated that, with those types of clouds. Thunderstorms are cumulus clouds that grow, cumulus clouds that grow taller. Normally, that change into cumulonimbus clouds. The bottoms get dark and heavy with rain. Lightning zips through the sky and thunder rumbles. If we're going to talk about this later in the year, lightning is seen first followed by sound of thunder because light travels much, 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 much faster than that of sound. So if you see lightning, then you will hear thunder afterwards. So lightning zips across the sky and then you hear thunder. Warm human conditions are more favorable for thunderstorms and typical thunderstorms produce a periods of heavy rain that lasts anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. Lightning always precedes thunder because lightning um, is fast. Light is th faster than sound. But you will hear the thunder, but there's somewhere along the way there was some lightning. Hurricanes. Hurricanes are more associated within our summer months because the water is get, starting to churn. Um, it is a storm in the ocean. It is a huge slow moving that is fueled by heat and energy in the warm ocean waters, causing high winds, heavy rains, and flooding. Hurricanes occur over warm tropical waters and have a, winds as greater can be equal to or greater than that of 74 miles per hour. 
So they're a huge ocean storm that has an eye in it. And if you look at this storm right here, that's an eye there in the picture. And those are the winds that are whipping around the system. And the wind is very dangerous. That's a very big hurricane there. Um, and the eye normally, a lot of times people, it'll go across and you'll have thick traveling of wind that goes there. And then they'll have the eye and the eye gets very calm. And they think the storm is over and they don't have to worry anymore. But look back here, there is some more wind associated with it. It's a circular pattern. So it whips around. And this is when warm water and cold water are not playing always fair with each other. And that's when the storm starts to brew when we're starting to get warm and cold air that are warm and cold water that are not playing fair and causing storms in our oceans. Tornadoes. Um, tornadoes are dangerous funnel shaped clouds of, in the air that reach from thunder clouds or cumulonimbus clouds to the ground. And if you look here, here's our cumulonimbus cloud and a tornado is coming out of that um, cloud spinning at the excess of 400 kilometers per hour. Most tornadoes form from thunderstorms as wind changes directions and begin to rotate. Um, they can are very dangerous. Um, they have, um, but we have character cat, categories known as F1, which is our least dangerous, to an F5. In Page County, we have have an F1 that has hit in Stanley. Now, if you live out in the flat areas of the United States, and that's going to be like places like Oklahoma, Texas, um, some Indiana, Illinois. Some of those flatter areas, because um, of the flat air, the two don't always play fair together with the air system. And because they're not playing warm and cold or not playing, that causes our um, air fronts to start fighting with each other, which forms our tornadoes or thunderstorms during those times. <clears throat> now, we talked about the three storms, thunderstorms, hurricanes, and tornadoes. Now, precipitation is the next thing. When we talked about a little bit about precipitation, when we we're talking about rain gauges. So precipitation is any type of um, solid liquid that comes from the sky. All right, precipitation comes in different forms. The first one we're going to talk about is, uh, is that of rain. Rain um, is cloud droplets um, become too heavy and fall to the earth as liquid water. Now, if we think about this, rain um, is where the clouds, clouds are made from water vapor. And as those water vapors get heavier and heavier and heavier, it gets too heavy for the cloud to maintain that amount of water. And it comes out as liquid because it hits cooler weather and changes from a gas to a liquid. So rain is cloud droplets that have become too heavy that falls down as liquid water. Now snow, all of you love snow and you know how I'm not a real fan of snow. Not the snow, just the moving of snow. Maybe that's a better way I should tell you guys. I like snow. I think it's beautiful, but I don't like to work at it. Sorry. Now that's off topic. Imagine that. Snow. Snow is the tiny ice crystals that are attracted to each other as they fall toward the ground. They're frozen precipitation. They're not solid as like a piece of ice cube, but they are still solid. We're considering them solid. Sleet. Sleet, falling snowflakes, falls through warm air, falls through warm air, melts because, you know, it warms up, goes from a solid to a liquid, and then goes through a cool air and freezes again and becomes tiny chunks of ice. So sleet is snow that has melted in the air and refroze and comes down to the earth. Very dangerous to drive in. The fourth type of precipitation we're gonna talk about is hail. It raindrops turn into tiny chips of ice. 
tossed up through thunderstorm clouds and recoated with ice until it's so heavy that it falls to the ground. That is um, the snow. I mean, not snow, it's where it comes down and they will be, some of you might have heard the like baseball size hail. So it is raindrops that turn to ice that's tossed into a rain cloud, a thunderstorm cloud known as a cumulus cloud, recoated with ice and then falls down to the ground. So rain freezes, chunks and freezes into a big ball and comes down. I have another movie on precipitation that you will be linked to on your Schoology.